All right, so let's keep going here with our story of the rebirth of the state of Israel, part two. And here is just an image of actually the boardwalk down in Tel Aviv. If you ever go to Tel Aviv, this very busy city I mentioned last time, uh, just a couple of the hotels you see there, you know, it's usually pretty busy, especially during the, uh, the touristy part of the year. But anyways, uh, what we had talked about last time was kind of the, the beginnings of the Zionist movement, of course, this idea that the Jewish people needed a homeland somewhere where they would feel safe and protected. Uh, and then how there was that issue of, you know, as the Jewish people were coming in through the Aliyahs, you also had the Arab population in there, and the Arab population was not exactly happy with the Jewish people migrating in. Uh, to that end, we had talked about Balfour and how he had the Balfour Declaration, which kind of acknowledged that, yes, this area should be a homeland for the Jewish people. It makes sense. That's, you know, where the Jewish people started their history. But at the same time, you have to take care of the other non-Jewish people living in this land as well. So we're going to kind of continue on to see how all of this unfolds. Um, also, just so you know, in your packet, you or I'll post one or the other, you'll have a, a timeline that's kind of a nice little, you know, chronological order of all of this. And it really helps to kind of make sure you have everything in the right proper chronology to understand this entire event from beginning to, to end. OK, so just be aware you have that. All right, so this is what goes on. So by the end of 1918, you know, World War I ends. We know again, just to remind you, uh, the land of Palestine falls under the British mandate. So now as we get into 1920 period, uh, after the Balfour Declaration, now the land is under British control, right? So that's an important thing to remember and note. And remember I said you had the two communities, the Arab community and the Jewish community. And in 1920, you start to see some of the attacks. So for example, there was a city called Tel Chai. Well, first of all, in 1920, before I get to that, there was the third Aliyah. So there was another you know, mass movement of Jewish people coming into to Israel again in 1920. So the third Aliyah. And as that's happening, this also begins to lead to more conflicts. And so one place is, for example, a city called Tel Chai, a settlement where Jewish people were attacked. Um, in 1920, there were about 47 Jewish, or 1921, sorry, 47 Jewish people killed, 140 wounded uh, by Arab neighbors who simply didn't want them there. Of course, the, the Jewish people fought back, defended, and there were Arabs killed as well. And so now you're seeing this kind of back and forth fighting. So now you're starting to see things really get a little bit more intense and, and more unfortunately violent. And so at that point, 1922, kind of a little timeline you have here, you had Winston Churchill. Now, this was way before Winston Churchill was the famous big Winston Churchill. Uh, this is in 1922. He's an important guy in England, but not the guy in England. And he wrote a paper called a white paper. And in this white paper, he basically said, yeah, the Jewish people should have this as their land, but you got to stop coming in in great numbers. And he's saying you can't have too many people coming in at too, too quickly because it's just going to disrupt things, create chaos. Well, again, in the 1920s and early 30s, as you could see there, nobody cared, right? The Jewish people had the fourth Aliyah from 1924 to 1928, and then another, not a surprise, massive migration from 1933 to 1936. Uh, by the time we get to 1936, you had about 400,000 Jewish people now had migrated into this land of Palestine. Um, why so many? Well, of course, this is the 1920s and 30s, right? This is the time when Hitler was rising to power. Um, Hitler's already in power by the 1930s, and it was becoming very clear to the Jewish people they need to get the heck out of Europe um, or they're going to have a problem. More, many more Jewish people would have liked to go there, but the issue was that the British were kind of not allowing a lot of Jewish people to move in. So now you've got a couple issues, right? You've got the issue of the Jewish people wanting to move in and the British kind of striving to regulate it. And you also have the issue of the conflict between the Arab and the Jewish people who are now living in this land together, right? And now all of that is going on as we get to 1936. 
this is an interesting quote by Winston Churchill because, you know, I just got through saying he wrote the white paper, but eventually Winston Churchill, as you can see there in his quote, he says, it is manifestly the right of that scattered Jews should have a national center and a national home. And where else but in Palestine, with which for 3,000 years they have been intimately and profoundly associated. So again, this, this, this quote by Winston Churchill is one that, yes, he does acknowledge this, but at the same time, the British were oftentimes dragging their feet. They weren't really willing to, to just say, hey, he, you know, here's a state and we're going to just uh, allow this to happen in the 1930s. Um, and so part of the reason is, of course, they don't want to upset the Arab communities either there. And so they're kind of in, in a place where they don't want to make anybody unhappy. So anyways, that's just an interesting quote by Winston Churchill. The next interesting point we get, the very next year, 1937, a man named Robert Peel. Robert Peel, he proposes what becomes the Peel Commission, known as the Peel Commission. And he's the first one, maybe if you follow this carefully, sometimes you've heard of this concept of a two-state solution, right? And you'll hear this a lot today even, and if you follow the Middle East discussions of Israel and the Palestinians and where should they do, and very often they say they should have a two-state solution. And Robert Peel was uh, one of the first to kind of think about that, where he said, you know what, maybe it's not going to be possible for the Jewish people and the Arab people to live together in one nation. And maybe the solution is to take this land and divide it and give some of it to the Jewish people, some of it to the Arab people, and each get their own country. And so that was an idea by Robert Peel in 1937. And people were starting to think about that. Um, but then, of course, what's about to happen is World War II. So World War II breaks out, 1938-39, we're into World War II, of course, and the issue of a state for the Jewish people kind of moves to the back burner, right? You're dealing with now a massive world war, Japan, uh, you know, the whole Axis, Italy, Hitler, and many, of course, European powers in the United States, when we eventually get into World War II, you know, see that as the bigger issue on the global stage, obviously. Uh, so this Robert Peel idea kind of just gets put on the back burner for a while. Then the war breaks out, right? And then the question is, what now happens is we get into the early 1940s. And you see some pretty pivotal events happening in the early 1940s, leading up again to eventually the official creation of the State of Israel. So in the 1940s, this British refusal continues. Um, as Jewish people were trying to go to this land that they want to be, of course, the land of Israel, the, the, the British simply wouldn't let them. In fact, uh, during the 1940s, the Jewish people who were trying to make their way into Israel were held into detention camps. They were taken, they were put into detention camps on the island of Cyprus uh, that the British controlled at the time. And this was during the Holocaust. So you can try to imagine, you know, you've got a situation where one third of the total Jewish population in the world is being massacred. They're trying to escape, right? And just from complete annihilation, right? We're not talking about, you know, I want to leave from one country to another country because our economy is bad in one country. We're talking about, I need to leave this country. I'm going to have everybody I know murdered, right? And the British like, nope, sorry, we're not going to let you let them into Israel. And they put them in detention camps. Um, of course, the Americans during the Franklin Roosevelt administration also limited Jewish refugees, as we talked about during the World War II lecture a little bit. Only 20,000 Jews were allowed to enter the United States from European powers. Um, you, know, you know, there were ships with Jewish refugees. I think I mentioned the St. Louis in the previous lecture that were just turned around and, you know, eventually all in gas chambers ended up. And so there wasn't really much desire to have, again, this safe haven for the Jewish people. Meanwhile, as that's happening in the early 1940s, the Jewish people that had already moved into this region of Israel-Palestine, I'm going to kind of call it both at this point, uh, because we're very close to it officially becoming Israel, um, they, they, they established their own military. And that military is known as the Haganah, right? So that's that term there, Haganah. 
Uh, it's literally the Hebrew word, which means defense. That's what the word means uh, in Hebrew. And it was led by a man named Menachem Begin. And Menachem Begin also eventually uh, will be a very prominent man in Israeli politics. And he, you know, was very determined to, to keep the fight going to try to get independence from the British. Uh, in 1946, you had a kind of infamous event known as Black, uh, Black Sabbath or Black Shabbat, as it's sometimes called. Um, and Shabbat is the, you know, um, Shriom Shabbat's the Friday evening uh, when the Shabbat starts in, in Jewish culture, right? Uh, you like candles and all that. Uh, and anyways, on that day, many of the Haganah leaders were actually arrested by the British. So you can imagine that the, the Jewish people inside of Israel were very upset. And this leads to a little bit more of an aggressive approach by some leaders of the Israeli military that were developing. They started to actually kidnap some British officials in Israel, in Palestine. Um, and one of the more dramatic things they did was there was a hotel known as the King David Hotel. And the King David Hotel inside of, again, what will become Israel, uh, had a bunch of British people in there. And it was a stronghold where the British were holding a lot of their official meetings and so forth. And the leaders of the Israeli movement, resistance movement, basically called the hotel one day and said, um, we're not happy with the way things are going. We have planted a bomb. And we advise everybody to leave because this bomb is going to go off and it's going to blow up this hotel. And they called, they gave a warning. They didn't want people to be killed. And so they called, they gave this warning, they ignored it. They called a second time, gave a warning. This bomb's gonna go off, it's already been planted. And I think, I don't remember if there are two or there are three warnings, but there were multiple warnings given, all ignored, the bomb went off, people were of course injured and killed. Um, but again, the point of the story is, it's again showing you where we're getting to by the 1940s, again. Uh, you're in the middle of the, you know, the Holocaust is now just about over, of course. By 1946, the war has ended. Uh, World War II has come to an end, but the damage done to the Jewish people by then has been, you know, unimaginable. Again, a third of the Jewish population. I think sometimes to help give people perspective of that, uh, it would be the equivalent of, you know, six, seven hundred million Christians murdered. Uh, that would be twice the size of the United States of America or about uh, 500 million Muslims murdered, right? If you think about it per capita, uh, that's the extent of what we're talking about when you talk about something like the Holocaust and the Jewish people is like, we need this safe haven. And so it's not a surprise they started to be a bit more aggressive. So the question is, what's now going to happen? World War II comes to an end. The British still control this land. You still have the issue of the, the Arab, Arabs living in this area. They don't want the Jewish people there either. Um, and so now things are getting pretty intense. And the question is, how is this all, if anything, going to be resolved? Is it even going to be possible to be resolved? This is just a quick photo I have of the Haganah, early photo of the Haganah. And you can see, you know, it's just kind of, you know, average people, right? It's not like a super high trained military machine. It's just, you know, these, you know, kind of almost would say like the United States in the beginning, the Minutemen, right? Where they just kind of, you know, average people who get together and go into the army. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but even to this day in Israel, uh, army is uh, military duty is is a mandatory experience for all Israelis, men and women. Actually, uh, today, if you go to Israel and you live in Israel and you're an Israeli citizen, all men when they're 18 go to the army. All women when they're 18 go to the army, um, and you have to serve in the military for a couple of years, two, three years, um, and then you have to the men actually have to do uh, reserve duty, and you know it's it's something that's required. Uh, and the reason, of course, as you're going to see as we move on the lecture, is once Israel is established, they're going to have to deal with a lot of wars. And it was necessary to build up this kind of army, especially since the population is really small. So this is kind of the early, early military of, of pre-Israel, right, before Israel is officially a state. All right, so then we get to the pivotal moment. And this is one of the most significant moments in the entire story of the creation of the state of Israel. So I've shown you this map before. We're going to talk about it a little bit more detail. I'm going to explain all this to you and explain why 
This moment in 1947 is so key to the history of the creation of the state of Israel, the modern conflicts between Israel and its Arab neighbors, the whole thing. So you see this word, ANSCAP. All right, what does that stand for? United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. All right, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. You definitely want to know that. So World War II comes to an end. The British look at the situation and basically say, we can't handle this, right? We don't know how to handle this situation. Uh, we don't know what to do. They throw it to the United Nations. The United Nations forms this committee in April of 1947. And this committee was some a committee that would meet for months. This wasn't just something they just kind of pulled out of, out of you know, really quick, uh, real quickly. They, they processed this, they looked at this land. And this committee in the United Nations, again, the United Nations was also just to, to remember, just created. It was a very different United Nations than today. It was much smaller. Uh, it had very different purposes. Uh, it was, I would say, a much more a organization with much more integrity back then than it is today. If you follow the United Nations today, the United Nations today is actually pretty corrupt. Uh, it has just an example I always like using is the United Nations today has a human rights commission. And on the human rights commission, the United Nations today, you have countries like Saudi Arabia um, and Yemen and other uh, countries that have been known to be very brutal uh, historically, and they're on the UN Human Rights Commission. There's a lot of a lot of unfortunate things with it. But anyways, back in 1947, this was this new international organization that that they thought can have some sort of impact on this. And they studied everything. They studied the population. They studied the land. They studied the resources. And what they discovered by 1947, when you look at this map, everything in green and everything in yellow combined, that population now had about 50%, 50%. About half that population were Jews, about half that population were Arabs by then, roughly. And they decided to go back to that Robert Peel idea. Remember that two-state solution. And you could see what you see on this map, the green, proposed Jewish state. The yellow proposed Arab state. And then blue here is this little international zone. And what they said is everything in green would be the state of Israel, be a proposed state for the Jewish people, what would become called Israel. And the state in yellow, everything in yellow would be remain for the Arab people. And then that would be what we would call Palestine, right? And you go, why didn't they just take this map and just divide it north-south, right? Or why didn't they, you know, uh, yeah, right? Why, or why didn't they just divide it east-west? Why does it look so, you know, funky? Why is it these kind of bits and pieces? Why isn't it, you know, all that? That had to do with demographics, right? What you see is the areas in green were heavily populated by Jewish people, like the city of Tel Aviv, right? Areas like Gaza were heavily populated by the Arab people. So this is sometimes what we call the Gaza area. And this region over here that I'm circling, right, this is what's often referred to as the West Bank area. It's the West Bank of the Jordan River, so it's called the West Bank. Even though it's in the east, it's the West Bank of the Jordan River. All right, anyways. So those areas had more heavy Arab population, right? Muslim Arab population as opposed to the Jewish uh, uh, people in, in the rest of the region. And so they said, let's do this. Let's divide it up and we'll make this a two-state solution. So this went to the United Nations for a vote and the vote was very interesting. When the vote ended, there were 33 countries that voted yes, we support this idea. There were 13 countries that said no. And there were 10 countries that abstained, including the British. The British like, we're not going to deal with this. We're out, right? We don't want to. But there were 33 countries that said yes and 13 that said no. Well, the 33 countries that said yes were all pretty much Western civilization, European countries, and so forth. The 13 countries that said no were primarily the Arab countries around what would be this newly created state of Israel. Um, countries like Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon, they, they all oppose this idea. Now, I want you to keep this point in mind. When they created the state of Israel, none of those countries, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, were, and none of them had any land taken away from them. Remember, this was all British land. They simply opposed it because they did not want a Jewish state 
in their neighborhood. It's that simple. I know sometimes people try to, to make it into, oh, no, you know, they're displacing all the Arab population there and so forth. Well, the Arab population was given a homeland as well. You know, what are you going to do? You know, th this, this is a concept of what do you do at this point? Um, and, and now there is an issue, right? Because are there going to be Jewish people living in this yellow area? Yes. Are there going to be Arab people living in the green areas? Yes, right? There's no way to draw this perfectly, right? But so you tried, and that's why it looks like this kind of funky looking map. And so the question is, will the Arab world be able to accept this two-state solution? And so, right off, 1947, it comes out, 1948, Israel says, we're good, we accept. There's an independence meeting, May 14th, 1948, Israel declares its official independence. This is the building where it happened inside. You see, uh, you know, the Star of David, you see Herzl, you see this, this um, uh, table here, the podium, all the leaders were there. They signed their Declaration of Independence. It's one of the primary sources in your packet, and I really encourage you to read that. And I encourage you, you need to read that, that primary source document, because when you read it, what you're going to see, obviously, is how there's this definitely tone in here that we want to work with our Arab neighbors. We don't want to, to have wars with them. We don't want to fight with them. We want to live in peace with them. And that, that tone is very clear in that document. Um, they met, that's the inside of the building. This is the outside of the building. Again, these are pictures that I took when I was there. Uh, and it's a very unassuming building. This is Independence Hall for the creation of the State of Israel. And so they create this document, May 1948. Well, as soon as this document is created, the Arab countries that border the State of Israel said, we do not accept and instantaneously they decided it's time for war and now you're going to get the beginning of the military struggles right where Egypt primarily but other Arab countries Jordan Syria Lebanon uh, Yemen and you're gonna see decide that we do not want a Jewish state here and we are going to try to end it right there and then these wars are, of course, going to be very important. There are going to be many of these wars. We'll start with the first one, 1948. There are going to be others in the 1950s. We'll talk about the Six-Day War. We'll talk about the Yom Kippur War. Lots of wars. And one of the most significant things that we're going to see is what does happen to the proposed Arab state, right? Does that state actually manifest? Why or why not? And it's going to oftentimes surprise people why that, man, that state doesn't manifest. And what happens to that land as those wars begin is, is pretty important, pretty interesting. So that's going to be our next stories. As we get into the military conflicts, what happens? How does Israel fight off all of these Arab nations? And what does happen as a result of these wars to that land that was initially supposed to go to the Arabs? What happens to it? Um, and so we're going to kind of talk about all that in our subsequent lectures. All right, so I hope all that's getting pretty clear. Again, you do have that timeline. Look at that timeline in your packet. Uh, the wars are pretty dramatic, as we're going to see. Uh, we'll talk about them in pretty good detail, I think, uh, in the upcoming lectures. All right, uh, again, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.